please join me in welcoming Wendy Allen. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Wendy. Can you turn this whole thing on? I hope it works. <laughs> um, thanks for coming today. I see a lot of familiar faces. Some of you are volunteers at Hopkins, some of you are scoot volunteers and walk the same beach as I do for sea turtles every season. And um, some of my colleagues from the reserve are here, so a lot of uh, faces familiar. How many have not been to Hop Call Bearing before? <laughs> All right, <laughs> we're going to change that, okay? Opportunities for you there at Hop Call Bearing. So um, today I'm going to focus on um, the program that the University of South Carolina um, has been engaged with for almost 50 years. We'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary next year. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, I'm not going to cover everything in this book, but I'm going to leave this at the library. 11 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this will be here at the library if they don't already have it. Um, I'll turn it over to someone. To, it is online. You can access it on our website. But if you're like me, you might like to see a hard, a hard copy. And uh, it's a lot easier, easier to look at all these figures and read it as a hard copy. So today we're going to be talking about um, North Inlet. And most of our research has actually taken place in North Inlet. Just wanted to start with this, um, this quote from Robert Mills, state engineer, talking about Georgetown in 1825. Take a look at that. A happier situation is not to be found anywhere. The good things of this life are here really enjoyed by the inhabitants in abundance of the land or the ocean lay treasures at their feet. Okay, so think about that. Think about why you live here. What are the treasures that you value? And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the estuaries. Um, humans have been interacting with estuaries for tens of thousands of years. And if you've been out to the salt marsh in North Inlet, you may see these cedar trees out, sticking out in the marsh. Um, these are Native American shell mittens, refuse dumps, where they threw their um, shells after feasting on oysters and clams. And in North Inlet, in the northern part of our state, um, they fed mostly or ate mostly clams. And then as you get south of McClellanville, the Native Americans used mostly oysters. So the oyster bins um, south of McClellanville, and we have clam bins up in the northern part of the coast. So there are folks studying this. Um, but humans have been in interacting with estuaries for as long as we know. So let's talk about the two estuaries that are close to Georgetown. Um, I've got a little pointer here, North Inlet Estuary, where we've done a lot of studies over the years. Waynaw Bay, even though it's the third largest estuary on the East Coast, it has been relatively unstudied. There haven't been that many studies done in this very large estuary. The largest estuary, you might ask, is um, Chesapeake Bay. And I'm sure everyone's heard of Chesapeake Bay, and a lot of research has been done there. Um, but we're, we're trying to change that. We have more things going on in Winyaw Bay. And what has been done in Winyaw Bay today is summarized in that book I held up. Um, two different types of estuaries. And you might, most of you know what an estuary is. I'm assuming that, but maybe I shouldn't. Who can give me a definition? Bob. So you, you, you can pronounce it. <laughs> You do such a good job pronouncing that word. I was just concentrating on pronunciation, never got to the definition. <laughs> Anyone oh, want to help them out? <laughs> having to do with rivers coming together and forming a bay? It's places where fresh and salt water meet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and in many cases, like Winyaw Bay, we have five different rivers flowing down, and it meets the salt water from the ocean. So it's a very classic estuary. North Inlet, on the other hand, um, we don't have major rivers. Most of the watershed is up in here, Prince George, Debbie Dew, and along this ridge, the Popcaw. So most of the fresh water is coming from rain events 
and the watershed is quite small as opposed to Winyaw Bay's estuary, which is a huge watershed of about 18,000 square acres. Um, all right, so some of the differences there. Um, deeper water in the bay compared to North Inlet. <coughs> North Inlet is one of the cleanest estuaries you're going to find anywhere in the world, and that's why it's been studied so intensively. It's a natural system that we can compare to more impacted estuaries that are more developed in their watershed. So very little development in the watershed, more than 90% of the watershed of North Inlet is undeveloped in a natural state. So very clean water. Um, and one of the interesting things, when my husband um, was invited to give a talk in France in an international conference, and I got to go, and I attended some of the sessions, but mostly I went out birding and <laughs> enjoyed France. But um, it was interesting when we checked in to register, do y'all get name tags sometimes? What's it usually have? Your organization on there? Well, in this international conference, we got there our name tags at Georgetown, South Carolina. Had our names in Georgetown. So people in Europe know Georgetown. And what we do, more so than Georgetownians probably. <laughs> so um, that's, we're trying to change that. But that was an eye opener to me that all these scientists from all over the world knew Georgetown, the work we do here. Alrighty, so why do we care about estuaries? Just a little background on um, the ecology of them in, in the part of the world we live in, we have uh, salt marshes that are part of the, uh, the system. We have tidal creeks um, that feed these marshes. And these are one of the most productive <coughs> ecosystems you'll find anywhere in the world. These marsh plants produce more food per unit acre than our best attempts to grow crops on land. And they are, they are up there in productivity to the coral reefs that you've heard about and tropical rainforests. So very productive systems, and what are they supporting? In addition to providing um, food, um, we'll talk about some of the things that people value in terms of harvesting from the, the marshes. Um, they are buffers against storms. They naturally absorb some of the effects of storms. So it's good to have marshes in front of your homes. Okay, let's, let's get down to some of the critters in the marsh. Um, you guys know these? In the crabs, right. Small crabs go out at low tide in the salt marsh, see the pluff mud. And these, these crabs are harvesting decomposed plant matter. They're eating clawfuls of mud, sifting through that mud, picking out bits of decayed plant matter and also microscopic algae that are on the particles of mud. Scraping that off, swallowing that, and then they form neat little balls of sand, um, stuff they don't ingest. So critical critters in the salt marsh. These are food for a lot of the larger animals that we're, we're familiar with. Um, another small shrimp-like creature, the grass shrimp, um, is in the water. Uh, they only get to be about an inch in size, so these aren't the ones we eat, but Everything like shrimp, birds, fishes, um, very important food for the things in the marsh. And then, of course, the, the edible shrimp that we like to eat. This is the number, number one seafood industry in South Carolina. Uh, we have three species of the edible shrimps, the white shrimp being the, the one that's the most valued crop. We have brown shrimp that come into the estuaries first from the ocean feed and grow, migrate out typically, just as the white shrimp are coming into the estuary. So the ocean estuary is very dynamic. Some of these critters are born offshore, move in as young juveniles, feed and grow, um, they use the bounty of the marsh, and then move out to deeper waters as adults. And that's the life cycle of the, the shrimps. <laughs> Then we have a lot of fishes that use the estuaries as well. Come in and to the tidal creeks. Um, on the top there is the spot, and uh, something that lives in the mud, one of the worms. There are a lot of different types of worms, and we have scientists who study these. 
Um, but the spots actually feed on worms and small shrimps. <coughs> it's estimated about 70% of all the fish that we eat um, commercially or harvest commercially or recreationally spend part of their lifetime in estuaries. So these are very important nurseries. And most of the fishes that we have are the young fish. You don't see too many of the larger ones. Um, they're protected, they, they're provided shelter in these tidal creeks, shelter from larger predators. And here, look how fat that mullet is. That's a baby mullet. You guys know that, baby flounder. And this is a young spot. And I'll talk about some of the research we've done on these different mm -hmm. groups. But I wanted to give you a little background on marshes and estuaries first. And then some of you know this one? Fly fish. What do you think that is? A spot deal bass, isn't it? It sure is. That's what we call them here in South Carolina. Red fish in the Gulf. Red drum is the proper common name. Um, and it's so named spot tail because of that spot there. Sometimes they have more than one spot. Um, very important recreational fish here in South Carolina. There's no commercial harvest of them in South Carolina. The red drum or spot tail spend the first four or five years in the tidal creeks before moving into deeper waters of Winyaw Bay and out into the ocean as adults. So these are young fish, even though they're quite large. They get up to 10, 12 pounds, sometimes 15, <laughs> in the creeks and then uh, move out as, as adults. Randy, isn't that the fish where it became popular to, popular to sear the fish, blacken? Yeah, and they were almost wiped out in the Gulf because of the wow. rage of blackened redfish. And uh, they, they uh, had to put some protections on the fish, and they, they've made a good comeback in the Gulf since then. Okay, some different critters. Um, if you're out boating around, you might see these pop up. The diamondback terrapin. It spends its entire life in estuaries. And uh, this is a female that I happened to see when I was out fly fishing one day, and she kept popping up. I had to take a picture. And of course, all kinds of birds are um, dependent on healthy estuaries for their survival, um, for my during migration, for nesting. Um, here we have pictured. Uh, Wood storks, one of our endangered species, and uh, they nest in South Carolina. They've been moving up over the years. Most of the population used to nest in Florida. We're seeing more uh, nesting in Georgia and South Carolina in recent years. And we see them, they don't nest as far north as North Inlet, but close by, we see them after the nesting season. They, they come up and forage in the marshes. Of course, moving on up the food chain, one of the top predators are the bottlenose dolphins. And we have uh, resident bottlenose dolphins that scientists have studied in North Inlet and have been following over the years. And this happens to be Eve and her cat. And she's been studied for 15 or more years now, observed, I'm, I'm thinking maybe 20. Uh, Dr. Rob Young with Coastal Carol Carolina University has has uh, gone out and they can identify um, individuals by their fins, their dorsal fins, and go out and take photographic records of them. And um, Eve produces a new cat about every other year. Of course, humans, um, we are top on the food chain as well. And uh, get out there and, and enjoy some of the bounty of the marsh, the treasure, treasures of the marsh whether it be out there to fish, uh, gather shellfish, uh, hunting. I didn't mention waterfowl, but it's <coughs> very important. Um, habitat for waterfowl. And just, just the scenic beauty. I think it's hard to put a value on, on, uh, on that. Are there a lot of alligators out there? <laughs> Not too much. Um, I didn't mention North Inland is very salty. Alligators tend to be in, in more fresh and brackish habitat, but occasionally we do see them. We see them surfing in the ocean. <laughs> if you're a turtle walk, walker, you might actually see that someday. Um, I'm talking about the importance of the marshes, but we haven't known how important they were um, until relatively recent years. 
in the late 60s, this is just a shot. Of, I'm sorry I didn't have one an area where I grew up in New Jersey where marsh was filled in. They were considered wastelands. Swampy, smelly areas. Didn't know that they had any value. And uh, so that a lot had been filled in or built on. Um, Charleston, Georgetown, these cities along the estuaries filled in a lot of marsh to build their cities. Um, this is a shot of Debbie Dew in 63 and here it is in 2006. Salt marsh was altered here, dug some canals. Plan was to, and dug some canals in the uplands and the plan was to connect it back, cut through some marsh and connect it um, to the tidal creeks. Um, this was done before there was any legislation. Um, the Coastal Zone Management Act didn't come around until 1972. And so 63, the only regulations that protected navigable waters was the Army Corps of Engineers. So um, a lot of filling of wetlands occurred, of salt marshes, before there was any legislation at the federal level to protect marshes. And we realized how important these things are, and there's now legislation to protect them. Okay, let's get in time. Um, Belle Baru. 1964 um, is when the um, Belle Foundation was established. The Belle and her father and her family would spend um, vacations and um, winters and springs um, at Hot Paw. And Belle eventually acquired the property from her father. She loved the property and she wanted to see it protected. So she established the foundation in her will for the property to be used for teaching and research in forestry, wildlife, and marine biology by colleges and universities in South Carolina. This is in the days before anyone was thinking about protecting land. So it's really early on. Some of the first land conservation, if not the first, for our region. And, and I should mention these are from the archive library you can tell me what it's called and how people find it? It's the Georgetown County Digital Library, but these are actually from the um, Bell Baruch Foundation Archive. So we, we hosted it on, on our archive, but it belongs to Hopcall. So uh, they're just the, sort of the portal, but if you have questions about that, I'll be glad to. And you did a lot yeah. of the scheme. Absolutely. Did. Thank you so much. <laughs> so this is a great resource if you want to go back and check out some of these images. So this is, those of you who have been on tours of Hopcall, you don't see this building today. This is the, the house that was there when uh, Bernard Brew purchased the property in 1904. And that house burned down in fire in 1929, so the, the structure you see there was built after that. So, there's actually four entities, Baruch entities, at Hop Call now. And so this is an older slide, a new institute was created just this year. Um, but up until this past year, We've always had the Bell Baru Foundation. It owns the property and it partners with um, the North Inlet Winyaw Bay to operate the Hop Call Bearing Discovery Center. We'll talk about that in a little bit. University of South Carolina was established, uh, the program was established in 1969 and Clemson in 1968. Clemson to carry out the forestry <coughs> and the wildlife studies initially, but we've all changed our names over the years, except for the Baru Foundation. Well, actually, this changed it. Oops, go back here. It, this was originally supposed to be Bernard Group Foundation. <laughs> and um, Belle died before her father, and he requested that they change it back in her honor. So, we've all had name changes, but the, the new institute is um, being run by Coastal Carolina University and Francis Berry University, and it's I'm not going to get it right. Um, Bell Baruch Institute for South Carolina Studies. Is that right, volunteers? <laughs> okay. And it's going to focus on archaeological, anthropolo anthropology, and history of the property, which is a new area. The foundation's been doing that and has resource people who've been working on that, but this will be an institute dedicated to that. So let's talk about the University of South Carolina's program. 
just to give you um, the structure, we have the Group Marine Field Laboratory on the edge of the North Inland Marsh here. You can see W.D. Beach in the background, or Hopcaw Beach, we call the southern undeveloped end. Um, then we have a year-round staff of about 30 um, employees, including the reserve staff and um, the centralized data management office that I'll, I'll tell you about. But we have um, a lot of folks coming as visiting scientists, students doing work here. So in the summertime, our numbers jump up to about 70, 80 people um, during the summer. Our first institute director is pictured here with his wife. This is John Gerber. Um, he established the institute. He really built it up and was director for, I'm guessing now, 30 some years. Really built the program. And we've had three directors since. Um, we've had a lot of international symposia hosted right there at Hub Call House. This is Hub Call House today. And this was about 12 years ago. We brought back researchers who had invited researchers who had done work at Hub Call to present about their work over the years. And it was really interesting because we had some scientists who had been studying for 40 or more years some of their projects. Um, in our kitchen at the lab, this is just, we have a couple of these murals or collages. It's all about people. A lot of folks have come through and um, participated in programs over the years. This is just a picture of one of two large collages. Um, it's kind of fun if you take a tour of our lab, go into the kitchen and look at these. <laughs> some interesting stories behind some of them. Helps us remember who we've worked with over the years, right, Beth? <laughs> And one of the larger programs that's operated out of the Baruch Lab is the North Inlet Wingau Bay National History and Research Reserve, or Reserve for short. Um, our mission is to promote stewardship of North Inlet and Wingau Bay watersheds through science and education. And we'll talk about some of that. Um, the reserve encompasses about 19,000 acres, and it in addition to the marshes, it includes some of the marsh islands um, and the waterways. So a lot of the um, land portion is on Hop Call Barony. The buffer includes all of North Island that's managed by DNR. And you notice a pretty interesting line here. When we were established, we went through a lot of public meetings. All reserves have to have a management plan be designated as a reserve. And we had meetings, and you can imagine some of the folks were concerned. What does this mean? Here's a partnership program with NOAA. I should mention National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the University of South Carolina. It's a partnership. We received federal dollars from NOAA matched with state resources. Well, this was being proposed, and um, at the time, the Port of Georgetown was much more active than it is today. So they said, well, what's this going to do? To the port, you're going to make us shut down shipping. And um, people who like to hunt and fish said, Does this mean you're going to keep us out of North Inlet and Winyaw Bay? Keep us from doing the things we've always done. So we worked with um, the constituents. We had meetings. Um, they got to read our first draft and they said, No, no, we don't like the way this is worded. They rewrote it for us. And so our management plan um, um, maintains. Um, existing traditional uses and we put the language in to satisfy that and people really haven't seen a change we're not keeping from people from going in and fishing and doing what's legally allowed through state and federal regulations and this line is just just outside the channel <laughs> We are one of now 29 sites in the nation, and the latest to be added was Hawaii, a site in Hawaii that's not on this map. And so there are these reserves around the country at the time. Um, in 1992, I think we were the 21st reserve. So there haven't been that many added since we were formed. And it takes quite a bit of work to have a designated reserve. We have two in South Carolina, as you can see, the Ace Basin in the southern part. And depending on where you have lived before, you'll probably see some reserves maybe close to where you've been. 
here's the report that I told you about. It's available. Um, in addition to having a management plan, all reserves were supposed to do kind of a site characterization. That was an easier job for most reserves because they hadn't done any research prior to being designated. In our case, we had over 20 years of research that had been done in the North Inlet and Wanyao Bay. And we had so much information, it was a challenge to pull it all together. So it took us a while to finish this, and we were really glad to finally completed this requirement. And it's, it's a really um, good publication for especially scientists, students who want to do work in North Inlet and Winnie Bay to see what's already been done. What, what have we learned to date? With every project you do, there are more questions raised uh, than answers sometimes. So it also provides new areas for research, suggestions for that. <coughs> So since this was published, we are up to about 1,800 publications, greater than 1,800 publications from our work here. So what are we doing with the reserve? Our, our management plan, we're in our second management plan, and we're currently revising it. Um, and, but our, our issues are pretty much the same. They're worded a little differently. But this is our existing management plan that's being updated. We're trying to minimize the impacts of coastal growth on water quality and habitats, and ecological communities. So how do we protect these areas? We know growth is happening. Sometimes it's slower, sometimes it's faster. But how do we grow smartly and minimize impacts to the environment? The other is natural long-term and episodic climatic events on the systems and human communities. I'm talking about storms, hurricanes and natural long-term changes that are being observed, like sea level, changes in sea level. Um, and then the third issue that we're addressing is really how do you maintain biodiversity with threats of um, invasive species and habitat loss. So what do we do? And that's a matter of better understanding the species and the species requirements and how we protect those habitats for those species. And we do this in a combined effort of research, education, and stewardship. And again, it's people. Um, these are the folks who work with the reserve. It's a little bit dated. Michelle Larocco um, was our coastal training program coordinator. And this past December, Georgetown County hired her away. And she's heading up the Environmental Services Division for Georgetown County. But, and we're currently trying to fill that position. Um, Beth and Hannah are here today. They head up our education program. Um, our research team, Eric Smith, is our, Eric Smith is our research coordinator, works with Susan and Tracy, and another person who's not pictured here, Baker. And Jen Plunkett is our um, stewardship coordinator. And we'll talk about the programs in a little more detail. Focusing first on the research and monitoring, um, this is, all sites when we first formed um, did their own thing. There was no national program per se. So we had a long history of long-term research prior to being designated. We continue some of those long-term studies to today. Um, but then in 1994, a couple of years after we were designated, an idea was proposed to do system-wide monitoring at all reserves. And so this was implemented. So all reserves are collecting water quality data the same way, the same instruments, and it's made available um, to anybody who wants to look at it. So in terms of water quality, um, we have instruments that are at these stations. This is the station in Debbie Do. This is Clam Bank. Um, this is our oyster landing station. If you come and do a tour of the lab, you usually see this. Um, and many of these stations have real-time data that you can access on your phone if you want. And a lot of people are doing this. They want to know what the water temperature is or what the air temperature is. Um, so these are our sites, the four core sites, just one on the edge of the bay. Um, in addition to these instruments uh, and, and the weather station that we have at Oyster Landing, we go out every 20 days and sample the water and bring it back and analyze it in-house for nutrients. 
We're really excited to have added a fifth station, um, or fifth location in Winyaw Bay to really give us information about the bay itself. And this um, is just off um, Belle Isle, those of you who get out on the water. Um, and it's marked because you don't want folks running into that. But we have instruments at the bottom and the top uh, gathering water quality data. This is also um, telemetry, so you can access this station as well. And what you need to do, you can just Google CDMO, Centralized Data Management Office, and download an app on your phone and pull in the stations you want to look at. You can look at stations anywhere in the system around the country. Um, so the Centralized Data Management Office is a separate entity, but it's housed at the Hapa Bering Discovery Center. When we built the center nine years ago with some funds from NOAA, National Group Foundation Resources, um, we provided for a staff wing for people who work with the Centralized Data Management Office. And their whole job is taking data from all over the country, from reserves all over the country, and um, providing some quality control after sites have done that first, and serving it up on the web. So scientists and teachers and students have access to this information. And you. So what is this information telling us? Um, talking about some of the water parameters. In addition to these um, system-wide monitoring stations, we've been doing water temperature in conjunction with some of the sampling we're doing for plankton and fishes. And so this is a long-term trend here. Um, of water temperature. We've seen an increase of about 1.5 degrees centigrade in over 37 years of sampling. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if you're a critic, an animal that can't control its own temperature, that's pretty significant. So it can affect the timing of when things come and leave the estuary, and it can affect what species are able to survive. Um, and I do want to credit my husband, Dennis, for this slide. I did pirate some slides from his recent show that he talked about long-term uh, <coughs> trends that we've seen in North Carolina. Mentioned sea level rise. This is uh, Charleston data. Um, main thing to look at here is that, especially in the past 20 years or so, there's been a significant increase in sea level rise. And over the past 37 years, we've seen a rise of about 4.3 inches. Okay? Again, we live in a pretty flat area. 4.3 inches doesn't sound like that much, but if you're not in a very high area, that can be pretty significant. So that's why we're seeing increased flooding, and we're seeing more erosion on our beaches. So what does it, changes in sea level rise mean to the estuary? So that's what I want to talk a little bit about. We've had long-term studies going on. Um, one investigator, who was our last director, Jim Morris, has been studying the marsh plants, the Spartina, and how productive they are over the seasons. And to do this, He's, he actually has someone mark individual plants and looks at how much that individual plant grows over the year. Science can be pretty tedious, I will share. Um, that's why I really am not a research scientist. I like education. I liked hearing all the findings of research, but to actually do the studies, it's very tedious. So uh, imagine lots of these plants, these bird, these are bird bands, basically. Um, that identify individual plants, and she's going out and measuring um, this. Also looking at, this is an instrument to measure the, um, they're called sediment elevation tables, how much the sediment creeps or disappears relative to sea level. So if a marsh is going to keep up with rising sea level, it needs to keep gaining sediment. So this is an instrument to help measure that sediment. Doctor, this is Dr. Morris. You can't see him very well. He's got a bug baffler on there because it can be nasty out there sometimes a year. Mosquitoes and no CMs. But he invented an instrument or a 
design, experimental design called the Marsh Organ. And if you can look, see this, the PPC is different heights, and they plant the marsh grass there, and the tide does the work. So this is accelerating uh, sea level rise, basically. It's an experiment to see how does different amounts of inundation affect the growth of plants. And he's used these marsh organs in different estuaries around the country and has developed a mathematical model that if you plug in certain parameters, you can predict how well that marsh is doing relative to sea level rise. The reserve, our program, has also been looking at how marshes are responding to sea level change. Our study is not just looking at the Spartina out here, but along a gradient from the marsh edge, marsh forest edge, all the way out to a creek. So we have transects, two different sets, and then we also have these SET, sediment elevation tables, that we monitor quarterly. Um, what is shown here is where sea level mean high water is now. This is where it's projected to be by 2100. So how is that marsh going to respond? over time. Um, and we've been doing this for about 10 years. The scientists go out, have these plots. These are permanent plots at each of these little rectangles. And they measure what's in that plot, how tall it is. So it's different species of plants. Especially as you get closer to the forest edge, you have a greater variety. You get some shrubs and things like that. What would you predict? If sea level continues to rise, what would you think would happen? Big storm events to do that with, but 
but certainly every storm prevents an opportunity to study different things. And we did that um, after Hugo, and we had some anecdotal information. What, what people saw after Hurricane Hugo, which hit in 1989, for those of you who weren't here then, um, we went out to the marsh and people said, it looks so clean. It stripped off a lot of the fine sediments. Where'd they go? Um, some of it ended up in the forest, um, but, and then it naturally accumulated over time. So that's a, a good question. Um, how, how do those things affect? We had some of the studies after Hugo. Uh, that was the biggest storm to impact us in recent years. So let's look at some of these other things we've been studying and what we've learned. Plankton, this is Dennis's work um, over 30, almost 40 years. He's been studying the plankton in North Inlet. And uh, they go out every two weeks, sample from a boat, and pull nets, and they're sampling two different size fractions of plankton, smaller guys and bigger guys. Um, plankton is anything that really can't swim very well on its own, it's carried by currents. Um, it includes permanent members of the plankton, such as copepods here, but also the larval stages of a lot of things that we know as adults. Um, this is actually a mantis shrimp, cool looking plankton. Fish, of course, this is a larval stage of um, a worm, uh, a shrimp-like creature, and this is a, a stage of a crab. Jellyfish are considered plankton as well. They, they can move some, all these animals can move some, but they're carried a lot by tides and currents. So what have we learned? Um, Not seeing this with the larger plankton, but the smaller fraction of the plankton, a long-term decrease in numbers. Larval fishes, seeing um, declines in the number of species over time. And this is being observed in other estuaries, although our plankton is, is one of the longest data sets anywhere in the world. Causes, we don't know. We can, we can track these trends, but we're not sure why. Um, just recently, we followed up a, a trawl survey of the larger fishes, shrimps, and crabs that was done in 81 through 84, and sampled the same areas with the same gear. And you can see um, the early years. For most seasons, these are averages for the seasons, um, significant decrease in the number of fishes, shrimps, and crabs that were caught. And I asked Dennis about this because I said, well, it's a little higher here. And he said this is due to some of those freshwater events that we had, floods, um, that skewed the data and brought animals from Winyaw Bay into North Inlet that aren't normally there. So we saw a lot of species brought in and they remained in the estuary through the fall. You're asking about storm events. We have kind of looked at how some of these, um, the flood event that we had a couple years ago and um, with Matthew. We've also done some work on birds, although um, most of that work was done in the, um, let's see, late 70s through the 80s because there was a faculty member from um, another college that did a lot of bird studies and had a lot of graduate students. And it was at a time when um, we had a big NSF, National Science Foundation funded project looking at all kinds of things in North Atlanta, including the birds. A survey was done to see what birds were there, what they might be contributing to the ecosystem. And at that time in the um, late 70s, they counted, uh, identified 95 different species of birds utilizing North Inlet. And the number one bird, in terms of numbers, is the clapper rail, or the marsh hen. And most people rarely see these because they're very secretive. Um, so they're hard to study. They, they, uh, but they, they had um, an airboat. You can imagine that. They flushed them up. That's how they were able to get a count of those guys. We don't use the airboat anymore. We don't have the airboat anymore. But, um, the second most abundant species uh, was the white ibis at that time. 
And those of you from the area might remember Pumpkin Seed Island um, in the 80s. Over 20,000 white ibis nested on this little island in Lindau Bay. Um, they're not there anymore. None of the wading birds have used it. We don't know why they totally abandoned it. But through these studies, long-term studies of the birds and feeding habits of the ibis, they found out some really interesting things. That these ibis, um, when they're feeding young, the young can't tolerate a salty diet. The adults feed on pithy crabs in the salt marsh. They're very salty. The adults have a salt excreting gland, and they get rid of excess salt. The babies can't deal with salt. So the parents were flying way upriver into freshwater impoundments and getting crawfish to bring back to the ground. So they were going way up the rivers instead of right across to the North Island marshes to feed their young. We had Hurricane Hugo come in 89. Here's another example of a hurricane impact. The island was okay, but after Hugo, we had no white ibis. The year before, there were thousands. And we think it was damage to the freshwater impoundments. Salt water got up into some of these areas where the birds traditionally had fed. They send out scouts to see about food availability. There wasn't food, and they didn't nest. They nested subsequently in very small numbers in the following years, but they abandoned the site. So, kind of interesting first story there. All right, to summarize, this is simplistic, and I, I kind of like this. <laughs> um, but some of these trends change the longer you collect the data. So I'm going to give you some caution here. This is just through 2010. We still are seeing significant changes in temperature. Salinity, when you add recent years, is more or less the same. Dissolved oxygen, say it's gone up based on our measurements. Sea level, definitely gone up. River discharge down. We've had some recent flood events, so that would be interesting to see where that is. But I think other than salinity, this, these still hold true. Um, we talked about the small zooplankton. They've gone down. Large zooplankton, the same. Benthos, those are things we didn't really talk about that, things that live in the mud. They're about the same. And then our fishes. We've seen a decline in the necton. Phytoplankton, as measured by chlorophyll, has also gone down. Sportina seems to be holding its own, but the prediction is it's not going to survive um, under the models over time. Okay. What do we do with all that information? It's really important to get it out to folks. So not just scientists, and uh, just sh share with you some of the opportunities that you have to learn about what we do. Obviously, the Discovery Center, if you haven't been there, please come by. A lot of exhibits, activities done by the Foundation and us, and exhibits. And one of our exhibits um, deals with sea level rise. I encourage you to look at that. Here's um, Georgetown predicted the year 2100. Um, so it, it, how do you plan for that? That's what we need to be doing now. Do education, and Beth and Hannah can tell you more about some of these things. Um, all different kinds of audiences. Field studies for school groups. Just last week, Beth and Hannah helped uh, DNR with some cruises of Winyaw Bay. Students from Georgetown County were treated to trips on the bay to study the creatures that live in the bay and did some on-land on uh, water quality sampling. We do some teacher workshops. We'll be doing one again this summer. Um, <clears throat> and we integrate the arts into um, science, technology, and math. A lot of outreach programs, including some in the libraries. And special programs that you can sign up for. Um, just a few listed here. Behind the lab coats, I encourage you to do if you haven't done that. It's actually uh, coming into the lab and hearing about some of the research, seeing the research facilities. Um, paddling experiences. Where's Hannah? There she is. She often leads those with uh, Surf the Earth. And feeding frenzies are a regular thing. We have animals to feed, so we do some education with that. 
Um, I mentioned decision maker audiences. We've got um, targeting local Georgetown and Horry County uh, decision makers. A lot of uh, trainings for them on issues that they've said they, they want more information on. And the big issues we've been dealing with on our trainings are stormwater runoff. How do you best manage for that? Um, how do you build resiliency with increased flooding events and storm events in the, in the communities? Just some of the topics we're covering. We have a master naturalist program headed up by Jen Plunkett, our stewardship coordinator, that's currently running this spring. Have some of our graduates here. Who's a master naturalist graduate? All right, talk to these guys. <laughs> I mentioned um, we're also about stewardship. There are opportunities for you to get involved um, with us, but also on your own to things you can do for the environment. We do a uh, cleanup every year, a marsh sweep in conjunction with the international uh, beach sweep, marsh sweep event. And most recently, we had a small grant from NOAA, NOAA's Marine Debris Program to educate people more about marine debris and what you can do to prevent it. And we worked um, to put a sculpture outside the uh, Discovery Center. We filled it with um, debris. We collected over a couple different marsh sweeps and beach sweeps and had a community event to fill it. And then we had a similar sculpture, but this time of a shrimp that we put down in East Bay Park. And some of you in this room helped fill um, the shrimp would work with Keep Georgetown Beautiful on this project. There are opportunities to do some citizen science with us. Um, birds are kind of popular, and we have a painted bunting monitoring project, a place where people abandoned them at our lab for a number of years. Um, and it's a matter of coming and observing for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, looking for bands, counting the number of individuals coming to the feeder at any one time entering it into a database. And we're engaged in a shorebird monitoring survey right now. For the past two years, there's opportunities for volunteer components to that. Um, and we're having the second of a shorebird workshop coming up this week. Uh, South Carolina Audubon is trying to create shorebird, shorebird stores uh, to go out and when you're out on the beach, educate people about the birds that share the beaches with us what you can do keeping your dogs on a leash, uh, especially during migration time and when the birds are nesting and so forth. So I'm just going to close with this quote again. And uh, open it up for questions. Robert? What are we going to have to draft for all these guys for time? In the salt marsh, that's the dominant grass. As you get higher up, uh, there are a few other grass species. There's another, actually, Spartina's changed its name. <laughs> but I call it Spartina. Beth, what's the new genus? I don't know. We refuse to change. <laughs> <laughs> Botanist and genetics has really changed the, the, world, uh, the world of botany. But um, they're constantly coming up with different names because they're seeing relationships. But, um, Saltmarsh cord grass, the common name, it's the dominant grass out there. You get higher, there's saltmarsh hay, and then you have some brushes, needle rush, that's more, uh, again, the higher edges of the marsh. But the um, saltmarsh cord grass is just uniquely adapted for growing in salt water. It's not that it couldn't grow in fresh water, it's that other plants outcompete it in a fresher environment. But nothing can outcompete the salt marsh cord grass in a salty environment. What's, Other questions? What's the invasive species of grass for Phragmites? Phragmites? Reed grass is the common name. Phragmites, um, it grows, it's not in the salt marsh proper, but you'll find it along the edges. It tends to grow in disturbed places, so, and it can be introduced by machinery, it's just coming and digging out ditches. Seed can be on that. And it's a hard one to get a control on. Yeah. Is, uh, is this a good time to bring up the islands marching out to sea, to ocean? I'm sorry, what was that? Well, those islands marching out 
to the ocean. Islands. Marching out to the ocean, moving to the ocean. Um, it's more happy to be the other way. The islands here right. are moving towards land. Right. If you, um, the sea level, most people see it on the beaches because we're constantly trying to protect structures. If you didn't have structures on beaches, marshes, well, or, or along the edge of the marsh, they would tend to move back with rising sea levels. So the natural process for barrier islands is for them to keep moving back. And um, um, you can see old shorelines. This is an old shoreline. And you're right, at one time, the beaches used to be further in. Um, this is our current shoreline, OK? But we once had ocean all, almost all the way to Columbia, when sea level was a lot lower. Or higher, sorry, <laughs> higher. So now we're in a period where sea level's rising, and the tendency is for things to move back. Did that answer your question? Yeah. Have you seen an impact from the synthetic pesticides and fertilizers used on golf courses insofar as the runoff? We do not measure that at our lab. Um, a lot of other folks are looking at that, but um, that is a real concern. There are all kinds of things that are in water. Um, we, have, in terms of runoff from land. Um, we've done a lot of work on stormwater ponds, but mostly looking at nutrient levels and um, fecal coliform bacteria. And there are good management practices to kind of reduce negative impacts on water quality from those standpoints, but I don't know about the contaminants. We have in, in this, there's what we have done on contaminants is in here. But it hasn't been a whole lot of work done by our lab. Very expensive work to have done. Have you done any of the microplastic pieces that? Um, not, not specifically at our lab. The Clemson folks <coughs> have been looking at this. They are at Hawk Hall. Had some, some investigators looking at it. Um, there are folks in the Charleston Harbor taking a look at this. Microplastics are everywhere. Don't know how serious really it is. Um, so that's why there's some things to reduce microplastics um, getting out there in the first place. But they're, they're there already. Other questions? Good questions. Where can you find information on opportunities to be able to visit and training and? Uh, yeah. Good lead-in. Hannah. <laughs> Hannah, you brought some current brochures. And why don't you just tell them what's coming up? Sure. Um, so we have these uh, paper brochures that we give out at the Discovery Center, but we also post it online on our uh, specific North Inlet Wanyape website. So if you just type that in, it should pop up. It's northinlet.se.edu. Um, so it has the PDF of the current events, public events that are going on, and trainings as well. Um, we also have a very active Facebook page, so most of you here on Facebook, just put in North Inlet Winya Bay, and we always have, um, again, the current programs that are going on, and even special programs that may not be on these brochures. We try to put these out seasonally. Um, this week I'm putting out our new uh, spring-summer public programs edition, so that will include um, an art and science paint night, kind of like the wine and paint nights that they have that are pretty popular going on around here, but this won't be specific to our site. So you'd learn a little bit more about North Inlet and the reserve and then be able to paint a really nice marsh picture. So that's a new one we're doing. We're also doing um, our annual uh, paddle trips uh, that we do with Surf the Earth in Polly's Island. So they bring the kayaks, it's $50 a person. So we do kind of a interpretive um, eco tour with that going out at Clan Bay Landing and then paddling out into North Inlet and usually putting the kayaks out on North Island or Deputy Beach. Um, so you can learn a little bit more about North Inlet in the environment um, and seeing it uh, kind of from a different perspective than you normally would. Uh, we also have shell midden paddles as well. One of the things that Wendy was talking about, um, paddling out there and learning more about shell middens. Uh, we have some feeding frenzies coming up as well. And then we also have a birding event that Wendy is going to lead um, for International Migratory Bird Day. I believe it's May 14th on a Saturday from 7.30 to 11. So if you want to learn more about the residential migratory birds that we have here in South Carolina, 
um, and kind of learn a little bit more about the birding research that Wendy does and be able to identify these species and learn more about them, you're able to do that. Um, so we are definitely online and if you do visit the Discovery Center, we have these available as well. And don't forget, if you donate, you get all of this and more. <laughs> <laughs> um, those brochures are back here on the table. And also when you mentioned the digital library, Julie went and got some postcards that um, you can grab one of these if you'd like to access. has everything on there that you need to uh, access that library. Thank you. Thank you for good questions and being so attentive. And I uh, encourage you to, if you haven't been out to see us, please do so. And we're open to ideas of what you'd like to see us offer. So in terms of opportunities you'd like to see offered uh, that we can help with, let us know. Yeah. Wendy, could you just speak for a minute to the, I mean, we can get into the weeds on this probably, but to the budget issues for funding um, the research yeah. reserves in the future? We um, are very dependent on allocation from Congress every year that decides the, the federal budget. So the, start, the budget process starts with the president's proposal, and um, NOAA has to support the president's budget, even if they may internally not be too happy with it. Um, and then Congress ultimately decides. And we're very fortunate the reserves have been well supported. The, the, uh, their, um, respected in their communities, and uh, Congress has um, gone um, and supported reserves sometimes when the President's budget is not. So um, this coming fiscal year, we're going to see, realize the highest budget ever for the reserves, um, which is really exciting. We're going to be able to do more this coming year at our site and at the Ace Basin site in South Carolina as a result. Um, but it is important for Congress to hear from constituents and let them know what you care about. They, they listen. Thank you, Wendy.